This episode is brought to you by you. That's right. Without you, we aren't able to do what we love, talk bikes. If you would like to hear more about gear, more interviews, and just all-around good bike BS, consider supporting us on Patreon. By supporting us on Patreon, you get access to behind-the-scenes content, surveys, and other perks. So, if you find yourself wanting to contribute to our success, head on over to 5339cycling.com and click support. We also accept donations of beer, carbon bits, and high-engagement hubs. (laughs) But that's awfully specific. (laughs) Anyhow... On with the show. Welcome to 5339. I'm Nick. I think I'm Andrew. You don't sound sure. Well, you know. Anyway, today we're talking to Ted King. I'm super excited about this one. Oh my god, this is like, yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's a little surreal, but... Yeah, but before we talk to Ted, what's going on? Uh, not too much. Well, actually a lot in, in some ways. Um, I'm still broken. But, well, and let's be honest. Uh, if, if this is your first time listening, Andrew's always broken. He's just yes. physically broken right now. Yes. Yeah. Emotionally, I'm okay. Mentally, I'm <laughs> all right. I'm wavering somewhere in the middle. But physically, my collarbone's still broken. We're trying some different things, but I might be headed for surgery. But in the meantime, I am trying some different indoor equipment. Recently purchased some rollers and I returned them. And then I so I love the return policies. I do too. Yes, I, I sold my Tac X trainer actually to move to uh, Kirk Kinetic R1, which is kind of interesting in, in in many ways. So it's I, I rode it with our our fifty three thirty nine group ride on Zwift every Monday at eight pm Eastern, and uh, you know as as pretty aside from the fact that I forgot to calibrate it ahead of time. Yeah, and, you win some, you lose some. Well, yeah, I thought I knew something was wrong whenever I was like pumping out 500 watts consistently. I was like, yeah, something's not right here. It's like you went back on a wheel on trainer. Yeah, exactly. I think I found my indoor strategy for the winter, and I, I like the fact that it, you know, rocks and rolls. But we've also been uh, testing some lube, which is which is kind of interesting. I don't think we can do. I, I'm going to steal your joke, but yeah, I don't think we can do a full episode on Luke no, for obvious we're se- reasons. We're severely lacking in maturity. I don't think we'd be able to get through that. As as every female knows, every male is basically 12. Yeah, I think the whole episode would just be you and I going... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Lube. Um, but if you haven't, if you're not following us on Instagram, which you should be, yep. we're trying out a... We're comparing Squirt, which is our, our, our normal lubrication. The chosen lube. Yeah, which is really, from my understanding, that's that was the first wax-based drip lube. And then, sure. uh, okay, let's not get overly technical. This isn't the Nerd Alert podcast. You're right. We're better in many ways. We can cut that. Our audio is better. Yeah, I will say that. I love you guys, Nerd Alert, but yep. your audio sometimes is questionable. Yep, call we, me if you need help. <laughs> we are we were sent some lube. Yeah. Which was uh, pretty cool by uh, Extreme Nano Lubricants. Yeah, they were kind enough to uh, get in touch with us a few months back, actually, asking us what we used and what we thought about different types of lubes. And we said we really liked the wax-based emulsion. And they said, "Well, we've got something coming. We'll send you some when when it comes out." It came in the mail not that long ago. I've actually stripped both of my bikes, both my road bikes, and have it on currently. So I'm in the testing phase of that. Super smooth and quiet, which all drivetrains should be. And then we're we're squeak, going a little squeak, squeak, yeah. Squeak, squeak. So I don't need don't to hear those. That? No, I don't need to hear huh? those people on the panhandle. Oh my god! Uh, and then we went a little bougie with a little Sil- with Silka. So it's super, super secret. Bougie. It's super secret, super bougie. Is yeah, what I call I'm, it. I, I'm excited to try that one out though. I've if you haven't, if you're nerds like me and Andrew, and you are looking for something to listen to in the weeks that in between our releases, uh, I highly suggest the Marginal Gains podcast. The CEO and president of Silka is on that show, and that's why I have decided to add that to our testing protocol. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to try these different lubes and see if we can tell a difference or if, if we're just going to settle on squirt like we have for the past for you <laughs> for a couple of years and me for yeah. about a year now. So outside of playing with lube, what else are you up to? So I've been adding, <laughs> thanks to Cam Nichols, actually, I've been adding some zone two rides to my weekly routine and... Yeah, they're boring, and I know you're, they're they're totally your favorite. Mm-hmm. But I I feel like I've been noticing a difference on the scale, and that's the only change that I've made. I've, my diet certainly hasn't gotten any better. So, <laughs> <laughs> from uh, from what I understand, after Cam had mentioned it, um, whenever you operate in like that 
I think seventy five percent of your max or mm-hmm. something. It's it's yeah, it's, it's seventy like to seventy five. The yeah, fat it's burning just, zone or something. Right. So I've 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 been happy with that, and I I do feel like the performance side. There's you know I, I'm starting to notice the bigger the bigger base as well. Yeah. So, I've. I've noticed with zone two, whenever I do like two or three zone two rides in a row, the, the next ride I can just hammer the beep out of beep. Yeah. Beep. And that's just for me, but like, yeah, admittedly zone two while being super boring is yeah. There's, there's a functionality to there, it. There's something to it. Yeah. It's it. And I, I, I had, a, so I had a ride today that I think hits home with you often. It is like the mental benefit, the mental health benefits mm-hmm. of, of riding um yeah i've got a friend that's just going through some stuff and i i know it would it meant the world to him to just be able to get out and just be on the bike and spin the pedals and it helps it's it's, it's really why you know one of the reasons why you and i ride as much as we do is you know it, the important physical and mental health benefits of of riding so you know i i know for me very few things are better than getting out and riding for a couple hours just to clear your head so yeah that's, I mean, it, just the, I don't even know where to start on that one. That's, yeah, it's, this is just an intro. So, you know, we'll, <laughs> yeah, we, we could probably spend a couple episodes on, on that topic alone, but definitely. Yeah. That we, was, yeah. We, we do have something new and exciting for the intro. And what would that be? Well, <laughs> it's funny you ask. We have some questions from people, which is yeah. kind of cool. So the first one's for you from, <laughs> From Gravel God nineteen sixty nine. I'm glad this username is easy to pronounce. I know some of the ones on some of the other cycling <laughs> media that we follow aren't so easy to to pronounce. But Andrew, why why is your casual pace a full on hammer fest? Well, as as I've said to different people, hammering is relative. And to be serious for a second, I do I you know how to be serious. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I do maintain employment, so. No comment. <laughs> but like uh, hammering for me is it's a it's a way to to get everything out and and kind of maintain that clarity that I need personally. Yeah, I can um, tell you've been off the bike more because you've been grumpier lately. Yes, this is uh, very true. But you know, it it's also one of those things. It's it's about proving something to yourself. So. You know, that that's one of the reasons I love TT so much. It's it's not necessarily racing somebody like who cares what what place you came in. If you push the limits, then you find out where they are and you can kind of build yourself that way. And it, it's kind of cool to at least for me, whenever I hammer, I can push the limits of what I'm physically capable of. And that's a great feeling for me and really helps my whatever it is mental clarity i don't i don't really know i can't explain it or articulate it but as greg lamond has said it it lifts that fog and those of you that have adhd will probably understand but like being able to hammer and get everything out of your system and and getting that clarity it's it's like a feeling that is none other so you know my casual pace yes well i do entertain some more zone two than i used to my casual pace is relative. You know, I can still get what I need to on a zone two ride with a few little like uh, more lively segments. It's not a true zone two ride. <laughs> yeah, I know. Whatever. You know, if I push it up a hill or something for like 30 seconds, you know, then I can still get that kind of that, that rush or clarity that I need. But yeah. So, you know, while we do say, and just to clarify, we do say hammer on hammer on it, it again it's relative to you so whatever your hammering is is hammering whether your hammering is you know pushing it to 15 miles or being able to do whatever it's it's about pushing your limit and, and testing yourself and getting to a place where you can feel good about yourself you know yeah but this next question is for you, Nick. And we only have, we're, we're only doing two questions because uh, we don't want the episode to go too long. But this question is for you, and it's from Eddie. <laughs> and uh, he'd like to know, because I, I know you've mentioned it, how do you get into Zwift racing and where should they start? 
It's a good question. I'll answer the second one first. Where do you start? Kind of depends on what type of racing you want to get into with Zwift. Yeah. Because there's so many options. If you are looking to do some team stuff, I would recommend joining one of two or either or both of them Facebook groups. There is a WTRL team time trial group where you can post that you're looking to get into team time trialing. And there's always people that are looking for additions to their teams, regardless of if you're a A plus rider or a you know beginner D rider. If you're looking at more of a Zwift Racing League team, there's also a Zwift Racing League team group and you can post in there. There's even though this is we just finished week three, there's still teams with uh, openings. So you can go there or if you're just looking to race because you're competitive, kind of like I am and you want to race, there's almost always races going on on Zwift. Yeah. Um, whether there's that's, always a crit. Yeah. There's whether it's crit city or a t- an indi- individual time trial. Um, I mean, you're never more than 15 minutes from the start of a race. So just, just doing it. But if you want to get into some of the more organized races, join one or both of those groups, that'll get you started. I really got started kind of because I have a competitive side. I started doing some individual time trials and then happened to just pass a, or actually I think I got passed by a person in a team type one Jersey and, uh, found out about the Zwift team that way and just started racing the team time trials on Thursdays with them. And then Zwift racing league started. And that's kind of how I got involved with it was just, it's a competitive outlet for me, but there's, there's plenty of places depending on exactly what kind of racing you're into or and what kind of racing you like and where your strengths are. Yeah, it, it's kind of cool because like Crit City, you know, you get that real high energy like the typical crit, but then you mm-hmm. also have different kinds of races. Literally, I think it was it last year I went where we had just a, a week of like terrible weather in the winter and I I literally did a race every single day. Yeah. And you probably did different types of races every day. Yeah. Like I would do a a longer distance race and then I did a crit and I did a time trial one, which was the Spain one, which don't, if it's in Spain, do not start (laughs) with that because it is terrible. Yeah. I made that, I made that mistake and I, (laughs) you told me about it and I was like, Oh, how bad could it be? And I did it and I was like, Oh my God. Cause I looked and I was like, Oh, five mile time trial. Perfect. Horrid. Didn't, it's didn't horrid. There was, didn't realize there was 700 feet of climbing in it. It's the worst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bologna. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, just just look for, I mean, you can, on the companion app, you can actually filter the events coming up by races. So yeah. you can see which ones are specifically races. Or you could join our group ride and uh, you could hop on Discord with us and we can give you more. Yeah details and you can be part of the shenanigans of the discord channel that is uh there are shenanigans that so, occur. so gravel god 1969 and eddie thanks for the questions more to yeah. come next time next Thank episode you. but andrew what can you tell us about uh ted <laughs> so yeah i mean super like funny I said, you ask funny you ask yeah so for those that don't know ted king is a former professional world tour bike racer turned bike rider ted is now an ambassador for the general sport of cycling So he lobbies in support of putting more people's butts in bikes, basically. Which Uh, we're for. Oh, yeah. We're for that. Yeah. which And and that takes the form of dabbling in gravel riding, coaching, hosting a pair of events with Rooted Vermont and the King Challenge. He also operates on the board of organizations like Mountain Bike Afghanistan. So he's into all kinds of stuff. But Ted was born in the New England area, specifically New Hampshire, but Vermont is now home. Ted has been a part of a few pro teams you might have uh, heard of. (laughs) The 2005 Under-23 National Team, 2006 to 2007 Team Priority Health, 2008 Team Bissell, 2009 to 2010 Cervelo Test Team, 2011 to 2012 Team Liquid Gas, 2013 to 2014 Cannondale Pro Cycling and 2015 Cannondale Garmin. He now races uh I not competitively. I mean he's kind very of. he's still very competitive. Yeah. But you know not a pro capacity, but he now races in a few notable events such as Unpaved PA, Stubble 50, Belgian Waffle Ride, Dirty Kanza, Leadville, Leadville. He's also raced in a lot of uh, European circuits, Giro d'Italia, Tour de France. 
Uh, so a few things you might have heard of. They're, they're kind of small races that... Yeah, uh, you know, nobody really pays attention to those, right? Yeah, they're not, they're not big deals at all. <laughs> but fun fact, in 2008, he was ranked second overall in North America for, for cyclists. So you could say he's a pretty accomplished cyclist, a standout dude, amazing to talk to. And uh, we really hope you enjoy this one because it was amazing to catch up with Ted. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Ready to get started? Let's do it. Welcome to 5339, a podcast about cycling for cyclists by non-pros. Let's get to it. Welcome to the show, Ted. Glad to finally have you on. I'm uh, super happy that you uh, agreed to talk to us. My pleasure. I'm appreciative of your patience for allowing me the time to figure out life for a good period of time. <laughs> no, I'm psyched I'm here. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks for coming, Ted. So yeah, I've been following you for quite some time and I, I know that so is Nick and, you know, just kind of the arc of your career is super interesting. And I, I love the, you know, everything from the, your pro career to gravel and, you know, what you're doing with untapped now. And it's all awesome, especially the untapped waffles. They're, they're pretty fantastic, <laughs> but you know, obviously you, you got to start somewhere, but where did you kind of get started with cycling and, and find your love for it? Yeah, I, Grew up in a small town in New Hampshire and rode my bike to school, which was a mile away, and rode my bike to my friend's house. And it was sort of the afternoon activity of choice, you know, go build jumps and and that side of things that we have here in America and in places. And, you know, I go off to, to middle school and high school, and I really don't touch a bike in those periods of my life. I was a hockey player, I was a soccer player, and I ended up going to Middlebury College. Nick also played hockey. Nice. Hockey such a great sport. I say that's my real passion. And I just sort of fell into this cycling thing. I went off to college. I went to Middlebury College, which is here in Vermont, one state away from New Hampshire. And at that point, my brother, who is three years my senior, was coming to Vermont to race the Collegiate National Championships. He had raced a little bit in high school. So, you know, peripherally, I was aware of the sport of cycling, but I remember early on still not understanding really basic concepts like how come the guy who just won the stage at the Tour de France is not winning the Tour de France and, you know, cumulative time and this, this whole thing. So yeah, my, my long story short is my brother got me into the sport. I was a freshman in college. I was trying to focus on academics instead of, instead of athletics, which were pretty premier in, in my high school days. And it just collegiate cycling is such a great thing. It was what I call, I mean, I caught what I called the, the, the tail end of the heyday of domestic road racing. Health okay. Net was strong. Saturn was around. Mercury had just gone away, but Toyota United, I mean, guys were getting paid six figure contracts here to race yeah. in the States. And wow. I, I raced three years domestically and then went off overseas and the rest is history. So there you have That's it. My brother cool. got me into the sport. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm sure professionally, at least everyone kind of talks about uh, Tour de France and, and things like that. But, you know, one thing I've always been curious about is Giro, you know, it's like less talked about, but it's it's a little bit more challenging in, in other ways than the tour. And mm -hmm. so what's it kind of like from the, the ground level? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, great question. I it's fitting. Today is Wednesday. Three days ago, I was in Italy for the first time in many years, and I, I this is a little detour in our conversation. Uh, I was there for an Ngamba trip, which was amazing. We were there for a week. It's bike riding, it's food and wine and all the good things. And I had, I made a, a Instagram post that I said it was a really nice to be back in Italy because it's a great place to visit, but a really difficult place to live. And I had a few people ask me like, "Well, why? What makes it difficult?" and my answer is the inefficiency, which <laughs> sounds like such a cheap American answer. It's like, well, who cares? It's Italy. It's supposed to be more tranquilo and, and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Which is true. And then I had to, I, I went back to my blog and I've been I've been blogging I am since two thousand six. And I just I mean, I'm like cracking up reading the stories because the whole blog was all I I maintained it through my racing career, but I wouldn't really talk about racing at all. I would talk about all the other aspects of life and, and the culture. Yeah. And yeah. There's just the inefficiencies are blaringly obvious and absolutely hilarious. I say if you want to like mail a stamp mail a postcard from the post office, like at least dedicate two hours because that's about how long <laughs> it takes to do it. Or the time I had a parking ticket, that took me about four weeks to 
<laughs> to figure out how to get it finally paid. Anyway, I mean, I think those things speak to what the Giro is, which is an incredibly impassioned culture. You know, Belgian cycling is is cycling is front page news in Belgium and in Italy. It's a little bit less because soccer is such a big sport and motorsports and Formula One and so on and so forth. Yeah. But but as a culture, they're they're tremendously into sports. And then during the month of May, I mean, the entire country is just painted and draped in pink. The the Tifosi is passionate. The people want to be out. It's it's very all encompassing. And so, yeah, my first. My first European year, I, I broke my collarbone in February at the Tour of California. I mean, way to make a great debut in your, your first year <laughs> with Cervella Test Team. And then I just, I stayed in the States and trained. I went back over to Europe and had the craziest lead up to to one's first Grand Tour that you can ever experience. I did Ronde van Drenthe, which is a really hard race in the Netherlands. I did the Ardennes Classics to Tour of Romandie to the Giro and finished finish all of them which is just bananas i mean it was it was That's trial awesome. by fire and that first year at the giro i think we that, I, I did the giro twice 2009 2010 and in that first year i think we had zero minutes of rain i mean these days i feel like you watch the race and it's like it's snowing or raining and just like bismal yeah, extreme was, weather on, exactly. on all ends bingo <laughs> And it was the extreme and the opposite end it was just like hot baking hot i had a ukrainian t- roommate and he believes that the air conditioning is going to get you sick. So we're just oh, dying of heat. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so it didn't take you long to warm up in the mornings then. No, no, not at all. Yeah, when you wake up in a, in a Instant puddle hot. of sweat. Yeah. Oh. Now, now, Ted, you, were obviously, you, you said you were on Cervelo Test Team. Were you – I forget the timeline of the jerseys, but were you part of the team when they had that awful white kit? Oh, yeah. That was uh, <laughs> <laughs> 2000. I forget if they did. It was one of the the years that we switched mid mid season. I mean, yeah. Cervelo the the team was so far ahead of its time in so many ways. From the you know the documentaries to the makeup of a team based on relationships and sponsorships and team dynamics rather than purely results, results, results. And so the results mm-hmm. came as a result of that. But yeah, they were they were. I want to say the first team that did a mid season jersey switch. <laughs> so yeah, I, I just. Every time I see pictures of the of that kid, I'm like, man, it's like the number one faux pas of cycling kid is never wear white shorts. They stand out, I'll tell you that much. And, and they're <laughs> they a conversation sure starter. Yeah. They look <laughs> they look good in, in photographs and that's in person, it's a different story. Now, now Ted, how, t- tell us about your experience being an American in the pro Peloton, because I I feel like there's a few challenges that come with that. I mean, one, cycling's not a, as big of a sport in America, so I feel like there's that respect factor from the europeans but i also feel like there's a language barrier too so i mean talk about some of the challenges that you experience being an american in the pro peloton yeah that's that's, the challenges are a thing most certainly cervello was my introduction to european racing outside of the u.s national team which was a half dozen years prior so let me think uh cervello was a it was a very international team that was 25 riders and 15 nationalities and spanish was the biggest representation but english was the common language so you know that was easy that was fun it was simple to this day all the riders all the staff members share something that i've never seen and, and no other teammate i mean it's talked about often just the camaraderie of that team and then going into 2011 that was my first year with with liquid gas i was you know in conversations with a variety of teams i think you you gravitate towards your nationality or a common language so at that point orca was coming up sky was just beginning yeah obviously garmin and bmc and i had conversations with those teams but i think my entire career was Having gotten into cycling late in college, I just had a very different perspective than a lot of my European counterparts, well, all of my European counterparts, and a lot of the Americans who, who also were sort of product of boulder cycling or something and have been racing since they're 12 years old. So I don't know. I mean, my, my point of that is like I, I went into it with a perspective of an adventure. And so, oh, yeah, like why the heck not? Let's go race with these crazy Italians and see what that is all about. <laughs> or let's go race with these Italians. 
dot, dot, dot. Oh, and then you come to find out that, that it is a crazy experience. <laughs> Most certainly don't speak English there. So trial by fire, learn a, learn a foreign language uh, in the heat of the moment. Kind of like the American way, trial by fire in, in some, some respects. Yeah. It, yeah, it is. I, I say, <laughs> I say that, you know, the, it's comparative to if you're a Japanese baseball player and you come pitch for the Yankees, Whew. they're not going to learn Japanese for you. Well, okay. Sort of different hierarchies because then you're going to have a translator, this, that, the other. Well, maybe but, the pitching coach might pick up uh, exactly, a few things, but exactly. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was wild. I moved to Italy those two years prior to that. I was in Girona. Um, so I did two years in Girona, two years in Italy, went back to Girona for another three years. My, my, background in, in having studied it in high school was Spanish, but in Girona, they speak Catalan, which is a very estranged dialect. So, I mean, you can get by, but it's that, that part's a challenge. And I mean, you could be as much of an island as you want. There are plenty of, at this point, there are a hundred plus pro cyclists in Girona. Yeah. Some of them are very ingratiated in the, in the culture and others are perfectly happy not learning a lick of, of Catalan. So somewhere in the middle. I mean, I, I could speak Spanish, didn't speak any Catalan, went out and about and tried to be as much of the culture as possible. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, you you kiss goodbye to your family and friends and miss birthdays and weddings and all sorts of important milestones in order to be at the peak of, of your sport and your profession. Certainly easier said than done a lot of the time, the majority of the time, but in hindsight, I mean, totally worth the adventure. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it... I'm sure that also impacts in some way some of your training and, and things like that because you have the emotional component as well as the, the physical component or mental component. But, you know, whenever you're away from friends and family, it's like, yeah, sometimes that can kind of eat away. Uh, some people do better than others. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I would love coming back for Tour California, Tour Colorado, Tour Utah, because at that point I became sort of the ambassador for the team. We had a lot of training camps in California. And I remember taking, I was friends with the folks at AEG. And so I got us first on the floor at a Clippers versus Lakers game. And then we nice. went up to the, the owner's box seats. And, you know, Vincenzo Nibali and Ivan Basso are just, they're sagging, like blown away with these connections. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that to brag because it is a, it's sort of dumb luck that the, the owners of AEG happen to like cycling and I happen to know who they are. And so, you know, they open the door to this opportunity, but Basso was just blown away. He's like, Ted, anytime you come to Italy, I can help you get to any professional sporting event. Like, <laughs> oh, man, thank you. Um, hit up Monza F1, you know? That's exactly. Oh man. I, I didn't go to a single soccer game while I was living in Europe, but oh. I think that might be one of my biggest regrets. European yeah. pro league. I mean, that's, uh, I had the opportunity to go to a, a match in 2004 in uh, Leverkusen, Germany. That oh, was cool. uh, something I will never forget. So yeah, 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 yeah. So obviously, your pro career has really had a pretty sweet arc. But do you have any favorite races that you did whenever you were in the pro peloton? Um, Tour of Flanders is a pretty big standout. And I was talking earlier about how how I sort of lacked a historical knowledge of of races, and that became glaringly evident in the, the span of my time in Europe. I mean, just not realizing how big a race like the Tour of Flanders is and how, how the entire country comes out and is part of this. It's just, you know, Flanders Sunday, Rendezvous on Flanders and Sunday, everybody's out. It often coincides with Easter. So, I mean, it's just sort of a top sign of spring dawning and, and I don't know, very, I have positive memories of it, despite in the moment being eyes wide open to just how freaking gnarly it is. Um, well, that's, that's the one piece of the the pro racing that's that's always kind of fascinated me is that you know when you're watching the tour or the Jura or the Vuelta it's like the, you know the helicopters just showing you all this beautiful terrain that you guys are racing through and when you're racing you you have really no idea you I mean you if you're in the peloton you're looking at you know somebody's wheel in front of you or you got guys on either side that you're that are blocking your view or you're if you're in the break you're there's so much going on that you're trying to understand what's going on that you know you're you're seeing some of like bucket list territory and you can't really get a chance to appreciate it. Yeah, I couldn't echo that any stronger. We were, as I said last week, we were in Italy. Uh, we flew out of Rome to come back to the, to the U.S. And I said to my wife, who I've only known Laura after my professional cycling career, I said, hey, I finished my first Giro here. And I went on to explain 
that final stage was a time trial through Rome. And it was funny because, it, you know, at that That's point, cool. like, I'm not fighting for anything. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm going to finish my first ever grand tour, which is rad. And at that point, I can finally look around for the first time in three weeks. And I'm mm-hmm. like, there's the Coliseum. And there's so and so and so and so, you know, these, these wildly historic buildings. That's super yeah, cool. You can't, you can't take it in really any other time unless there's something sort of extenuating circumstance like that. Very cool. So in 2015, whenever you retired from the pro Peloton and transitioned to, you know, I, I guess kind of gravel, but I'm sure there was probably like an in, in between. Can you tell us, I mean, cause gravel is taking off and I mean, I, I've done a few gravel races and I know Nick is uh, slowly getting into it, or at least I'm trying to throw him into it. You know, it's, it's something that's very special and it has a very different environment than like crits and TTs and things like that. And, and it's just, I don't know, it's somewhat akin to mountain biking, dare I say, but not as like flannel. mountain biking in its origins, not, yeah. not how it is now. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. can, can you tell us how that transition from road to gravel went and, you know, training or, or anything thereof? Yeah. I mean, that's a, I don't want to say a podcast unto itself, but <laughs> I'm sure it could you know. be. Okay. So, so, you know, where to start? I, I had raced 10 years, um, up until 2015 and it was early in that season that I said, you know what, I've, I guess accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. I wanted to get on with my life in a different manner. So early in that season, I recognized I want to retire. I announced it right before I tour of California and raced through the end of the year, not really knowing what I'm going to do subsequently. I, I have a degree in economics from the kind of college that you often end up on Wall Street and, and study okay. finance and work finance, which, you know, all my collegiate, you know, fellow classmates, yeah, they either ended up on the New York Stock Exchange or Chicago Stock Exchange or or are entrepreneurs in one way or the other. And it just that never spoke to me. I'm glad I got that education, but it wasn't something that I was dying to do. Like I'd much rather race a bike. So my point being, I half assumed that I was going to step away from cycling and get into finance because that's what might be the logical step. However, sometime in the middle of that uh, retirement period in 2015, beginning with Cannondale, they were the first sponsor to say, hey, if you'd like to do something out of psych- uh, out of the world tour, but still in cycling, we're, we've got your back. And I think at that point, I looked at somebody like Tim Johnson, who's fellow New Englander, a good friend. He had a relationship with Cannondale. He... I forget exactly where he was in his racing career. I mean, it was, it was certainly towards the end, if not having already retired in 2015. And, you know, the term ambassador might be loosely thrown around then, but certainly not the way it is now. And the term gravel most certainly was not used in the same <laughs> context it is now. So, yeah, I mean, I, I beginning with Cannondale and, and then gaining a couple other sponsors, stepped into 2016. And the goal was to be an ambassador, to go to events, be part of product launches, to be part of uh, R&D teams, to you know, be often on the hospitality side of the sport as okay. products or as companies are doing product launches. But then on a whim, I was invited to do Dirty Kanza and by, by Rebecca Rush, and I did it. And I think that has sort of launched me into the, the place I am in the sport. And it's interesting because I feel like the sport has, has followed suit. And by no means am I saying, like, I'm... If it weren't me, I think it would be somebody else. It's almost like gravel has an inevitability to it because it is so much fun. And it is so gravitating. Yeah. It's so welcoming too. I mean, it's yeah. It, it doesn't matter if you've got great kid or terrible kid. Or I mean, it you know everything I understand about the big gravel events is yeah. There's a there's a small group that's using it as a race, but so many other people, it's just it's a it's a big group ride. And you, you know, I mean, I remember yeah. your podcast from was it earlier this year where you were at the finish line, and every time someone would cross the finish line, I could hear in the background people cheering yeah. on. And mm-hmm. this was well after the you know the race was officially over because the the pros were all finished. But like that welcoming atmosphere is something I think the the, the roadside needs to get back to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think something you talk about often in gravel is if sort of the democratization of it. So if you are dropped from the lead group at 10 minutes into the race, you're with your people and you're with what, whatever fitness group and demographic you're meant to be with. And you're going to ride with them over the course of the next two, three, five, 10 hours. Yeah. If you're in a road race and you're dropped 10 minutes in, you may as well save time and go back to your car and go home. <laughs> uh, that it's, it's cool where you, you fit in where you're supposed to fit in, in gravel, that 
and I think that that speaks to the welcoming nature. It speaks to the the fun of it. The I, I love what the Williams brothers are doing for crit racing in America. And I mm-hmm. think yeah. if anywhere in the world crit racing is going to succeed, it's going to be here in the States. And it takes that that lively energy that they have. But absolutely, yeah. if you see a crit, I mean, I feel like every downtown in America needs a criterium and that's just fun to see. But if you see a crit and you're not in cycling at all, you watch somebody crash in corner two and lose a lot of skin and swear like that. That's not necessarily appealing. I, f- I feel like crits and time trials, are, they're not they're going to be a draw for a certain small demographic, but the, the masses aren't going to be interested. Whereas, yeah, like you said, kit is unimportant. Show up in your jeans and, and cowboys. Well, those, are, like, those are some of the people you got to watch out for that. They show up on like a single speed Huffy from 20 years ago and they've got cut off jean shorts and you know, no non cycling shoes. And they're the ones leading. They will <laughs> leading proceed to torture. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. crazy. It's, yeah, uh, it's it's funny you say that I had a TT this summer and, and I showed up and, you know, waiting in line to get to the starting gate. And the, the one woman turns around, looks at me and she looks at my bike and she goes, you know, you could get a few more Watts if you had, I don't remember shoe the word. covers. It was, yeah, shoe covers. And I was like, the, okay, the biggest issue is the, the human above the saddle. Like the, the, yeah. the cinder block. I am a, I'm shaped like a <laughs> cinder block. I'm not exactly what you would call a traditional cyclist. <laughs> and she just looked at me. She's like, what? And I was like, it doesn't matter. I was like, I'm here for fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready to do this. And like, I just wanted to do a TT and we found a cheap TT bike and Hey, let's do it. Perfect. You know? Yeah. Run what you brung. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, now, Ted, it seems to, that it's becoming more common to see world tour riders, whether it's the men's or women's Peloton kind of taking that transition into the gravel quote unquote alternative scene. I mean, is, do you think we're going to see that become more common and like, will we see more world tour teams follow how EF has created a, an alternative schedule for their riders? One of a few million dollar questions. My, my crystal ball tells me that in America that won't take place, at least not anytime soon. EF bringing one or two riders, Trek bringing one or two riders from their world tour programs. I think that, works well in the, in the States. I can never see Takuna quick step showing up at a gravel race, except how, you know, we see, what is it? Tro bro Leon, like how gravel is, is beginning. It's very nascent in Europe. Not to say that American gravel racing has that much more history, but it's, it's so young in Europe. That's where with the advent, I mean, no better time than today, the UCI announcing that there's going to be a gravel world series primarily in Europe. Yeah. I think it's it will have much more of that race penchant in Europe than than we have here in the States. Maybe Ineos will be on board since they've uh, switched to disc brakes. Yeah, exactly. They can <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> who honestly who knows? It's it's really hard to see. It's really hard to say. My personal hope is is it doesn't get taken over by by hellbent racers. I mean, you asked a question yeah. a while ago about about training in gravel. And one thing that I like I stopped training when I, I came over to gravel and to do this ambassador thing. Like I ride a bike because I love, love riding a bike, but I would, I gave up intervals. I gave up, gave up the, the regiment. I stopped having a coach. I stopped logging my training, all that stuff. I then that. That's great. now many years later, as a result of these guys coming directly from the world tour and claiming that they're going to ruin gravel, Pete, I love you. <laughs> I have to now step up my game again. Residual fitness will only take you so far, especially now six years removed from the world tour. So, yeah, you know, if, if we're purely racing road bikes off road, that's, I think it comes back to the, the culture, the, the fun, the masses. I mean, these events bring 2000, 3000 people, and it's a very, very small group that is on the pointy end of the race. And so it's, it's really cool that the masses are there and, and yeah. you know, that's reciprocal because the, the front of the race likes being at the races with a whole lot of people and that's where they want to perform. And the whole lot of people want to know what happens at the front of the race. So it's, it's just this big synergistic amoeba of, of how these races are going to unfold. So you, you kind of alluded to it earlier, but you know, obviously with it becoming a little bit more racy in some respects and or race, not racy race ish. No, that's yeah. okay. With I it like becoming more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there any like worry or concern that UCI is going to come in and just kind of ruin the gravel atmosphere? Or 
you know, as us being Americans, just be like, no, nah, stay in Europe. Like, you know, we'll, we'll handle the fun here. Big time. Yeah. yeah. I've been to meetings hosted by USA cycling. What a year and a half ago. Um, where, where at that point they said, Hey, you know, there's, there's almost, there is an inevitability to it. You, the UCI is coming like it or not. Yeah. How do you want to be involved? And this was a message to primarily race organizers, um, here in the States, but, and I was sort of a quasi representative of the racers themselves. Um, there's a lot of conversations going on. I know there's a, there's a cohort of, of call it pro female gravel, race, gravel racers. There's another one of pro men gravel racers. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's a head scratcher unto itself. Like the term pro gravel racer is enough to make me want to vomit. It's an oxymoron. Um, yeah. Yeah. But then, yeah, I mean, that, that's what breeds the UCI. It breeds rules. It breeds series. It breeds all the things that I think people are trying to, to not be part of, not all people, but yeah, the majority of people come to gravel for the lack of all of those things. It's uh, you know, it's the, the fun police it you know it take taking out of the because that's one of the the beautiful things about gravel it's like for me at least it's it's like one of those things that's like purely american it just mm -hmm. you know, show up have fun it's about the camaraderie yeah we're here to ride our bikes and you know we want to do well and challenge ourselves but it's it's more about meeting people i mean you know i've met some several good friends at uh, a few gravel races around here and i want to trade it for a second i currently mm -hmm. don't have a gravel bike but you know getting back there <laughs> but, uh, yeah exactly that's I, I did sell my gravel bike but yeah that's a different story for a different day um but yeah i mean so are you kind of training at all or do you oh uh, yeah for the, the... i i have had to turn back on the training i i do not have a coach i do okay. not log my training i i train as unspecifically as possible i think okay <laughs> I haven't done anything that resembles VO twos in, in a way too long. I'll go do those or, um, happen to be in hilly terrain. So I'll go do some threshold climbing. Um, yeah, it, I mean, especially with a, we have a, my wife and I have a one and a half year old daughter. Um, I may, I own a couple businesses. I, I am a vent coordinator. My point is it's catch as catch can like, Oh, yeah. it's not raining today. And I haven't ridden in a while. I'm going to go outside and train. Oh, it's raining tomorrow. That seems like a good day off. So <laughs> catch as catch can. Yeah. I, I like you. it. Yeah. Now you, you, you get to travel quite a bit, obviously. You, I mean, you were, you were just overseas, but when you're somewhere new, how do you find your, your gravel routes to ride? What's your, what's your best advice for, for those looking to find some new, new territory to explore? Great question. I get that question often, especially in places that I have visited. It's like, you know, Hey Ted, I'm in Vermont. Where should I ride? And, and I mean, a place like Vermont, it's like, just go ride. There's literally oh, yeah. two roads in the entire state that I say avoid. One of them is the, the interstate <laughs> and you cannot go wrong. Ride with GPS is a product and software and website that I've used for, for ages. I mean, I can't even remember when I first got on it. That's my everyday tool when I'm exploring new areas or even back home, trying to piece together, you know, like I'm aware of, I like this zone. I like this zone. Oh, Hey, how the heck can I link the two of them? I mean, I, I tell folks to reach out to local cycling groups, to local bike shops. I think we live in the age that the successful bike shops are the ones that have uh, a, a yeah. positive outward face to them. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're only there to help. Yeah, that's a good that's a good piece of advice. I know the one shop that Andrew and I um, are big fans of around here. They they do weekly road rides and they do typically monthly, maybe two two a month gravel rides. So, I think that's a definitely a good piece of advice is find your LBS that. We'll show you some of the roads or, or routes. Bingo. Also, uh, gravelmap.com is a pretty cool resource. I don't know if you've ever used that, but I have stumbled on that. And and not to keep going back to Ride of the GPS, Ride yeah, of the yeah. GPS just within the past week or so launched a new surface. I forget the term surface type. So as okay. you create your route, it'll say, okay, this is paved, this is gravel, this is paved, oh, this is gravel sweet. with ridiculous accuracy. So Kind of oh, piggybacking off of that. how Kamut is. Well, yeah. and, and Strava's yeah. now doing it too. But I'll definitely check that out because I, I, admittedly, I like ride by ride 
with GPS a little bit better than some of the other ones, but primarily because of the way it exports the TCX file. Because I'm yeah, a huge, it's, huge it's, nerd. It's the most streamless but, way to get the routes on your computer, or if you're using a phone, it's it's just so so seamless that way. Yeah, yeah. super simple. Always has been. I mean, it just does what you want it to do, and nothing more. Nothing yeah. less. Now, part of our offline conversation was, uh, you know, around your passion for cooking and baking as well. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll, I, I'll, I'll say, if, you know, it's not manly if you're going to come down and make us a souffle or something. I'll, I'll totally play that card. <laughs> but, you know, where did that come from? Uh, you know, is that something that was developed when you were overseas or is that something you've, you've had as a passion your whole life? Uh, much more a whole life. I think my mom cooked amazing meals as a kid. I mean, she wasn't making five star meals, but she, every meal was well-rounded. We had family dinner every single night. Uh, she would, you know, make like <laughs> the, the, the sandwich at lunch in middle school that everybody wanted to trade for. Um, yeah. <laughs> so just, that was, know, that was the who's who. If you had something that somebody wanted out of your lunch sack that, you know, oh, you were, man. you were the most popular kid at the, in the cafeteria. I had, I had, I had the Bitcoin of lunch. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, it's stemmed around that. It's stemmed around. I like baking. I mean, I like, I like the simplicity of baking. You know, people talk about how, how you need the, the hyper accuracy and it's a science much more than an art. And I've, I've baked enough pumpkin pies and pumpkin breads and banana breads and cookies in my life that it is an art for me. Like I just mix things together and I know rough ratios, but it's like, okay, a little more, oh, of this, it's, a little less it, of that. It's totally an art. My, my grandma yeah. was like the most amazing baker that I've ever experienced. And my cousin has all of her recipes, but she, she makes them and she gets so mad. She's like, they're really good, but they're not grandma's cookies or they're not grandma's brownies. Like she just had that, yeah. you know, it's a little extra or, you know, a little light uh -huh. on this or, and it was you know, like, Katie cannot get grandma's cookies right and she it makes her so mad because she has grandma's recipes oh uh, that's hilarious yeah i found home ex so i'm gonna stay out of this one <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah i mean you go into the world to or, or professional side of things and you're often you have to make a, a healthy meal a quick meal a calorically rich meal uh yeah. and just yeah I've, I've always enjoyed food well i imagine that's that can be a the challenge not so much for the riders but for the you know, the support staff to create something that is calorically dense, but also something that you can eat enough of mm -hmm. that is going to fuel you for, you know, one recovery from that day's, but also fuel you for the next day. And, you know, I, I imagine it's almost a full-time job just eating enough calories when you're ra racing at that level. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword of fueling enough, but perpetually being starved and starving. Um, <laughs> strength to weight ratio is very much a thing in the world tour. And I happily have bid that farewell <laughs> <laughs> was your love for food one of the things that kind of led you into untapped yeah i mean it was seeking out a, a real food alternative to the pseudo food franken foods that i'd had for for so long i mean you there's the ten thousand hour rule where that's where you learn hyper proficiency mm -hmm. and i say that over the course of my career i had ten thousand too many gels right? some of those gels I mean, are oh dude they aren't right right like, and, and, and you think about, for example, their brown rice syrup is a popular ingredient in sports nutrition yeah. and some wildly high percentage, 90, 95%, I'm making that number up, but it is very high percent of brown rice syrup contains arsenic and arsenic is something that belongs in your cigarettes and rat poison, not yes. your sports nutrition. And, and we're having and conversations. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. Cherry yeah. pits, apple, apple seeds, yeah. I mean, things that you don't eat. Yeah, it's typically. So it, right, it is. It's it's it can be naturally sourced, but it's something you don't want. And and I remember having a conversation with somebody at one of these companies. They said, "Well, you know, it's yes, we are aware that there's arsenic in it, but it's only worrisome in high concentrations." And I'm like, <laughs> "The ten thousand. That's, that's exactly rule. what you want to hear, right? Like you have gel after gel after gel. I mean, the people who consume gels consume a lot of them. Um, yeah." So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like, it goes back been, to that. It's like, just, if you've been stabbed and you go to the ER and they're just uh -huh. like, Oh, you've only been stabbed a little bit. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. 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 You'll, like, be okay. well, You'll be still, okay. Yeah. So it might've been a bad example, but <laughs> that was an entertaining example. I'm not, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was searching out a more natural 
wait a few of my rides. There are a few things, different things going on at the same time. I'm living in Europe. I'm from New England. I would have family and friends send me traditional quartz pints of maple syrup. <laughs> yeah. I would step off the bus at bike races and fans will have brought maple syrup <laughs> and they'd gift it to me. Oh, cool. Which is freaking amazing. Like you can't buy the stuff in Europe by and large. So I'd go back home and I'd have it in the fridge and I would take little nips before, during or after bike rides. And, and you know, that's where the wheels were turning. It's like, there's got to be a way to put this maple syrup in this gel pack. And it took uh, the better part of two years to, to sort that all out, to get that first pack in hand. It's, it took meeting with the partners who were over my shoulder in, in another room. It took crowdfunding. It took having me at my first Tour de France and using that platform to, to get the message out. And yeah, we've been going strong since 2014. No, so I'm, I've got to ask this because I'm I'm type one diabetic. So obviously, fueling on my rides is challenging at times. And yeah. and I found that you know the Honey Stinger products work really well for me. Have you found that there's like biological benefits to the the natural sugars in the the maple syrup as well? Oh my yes! I don't even know where to start. Um, the another podcast but, all in itself. <laughs> exactly. The majority of Vermont ambulances and first responders carry Untapped as as uh, a diabetic response tool. Wow. Where maple syrup is low glycemic, so you won't spike your insulin. Very mm -hmm. simple to eat, easy to eat. I mean, it's it's nutritionally speaking, it's it's loaded with amino acids, electrolytes, antioxidants. It is categorically a superfood in the same category as blueberries and red wine and, and chia seeds and all these things. And you know, you think about the alternative. It's it's candy. It's supplemented candy. It's it's flavored. It's inert sugars. So whether That's fantastic. <laughs> yes, maple syrup is fantastic. Yeah. Those other things are just they're they're foul. So oh, yeah. yeah, it's nice to preach the message of organic maple syrup because it's wholesome, it's nutritious, it's delicious, it's just it's brilliant. I'm gonna I'm interested when I get some some waffles and some some honey packets coming in to see how the timing works because you know the artificial sugars almost seem like they they have like a delayed onset. And then there's like a massive spike for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the natural options seem to be much better where it's like I can get a quicker response, but I don't get that same spike. For reasons of my own bias, I just think maple syrup's better. It is more, yeah. it's, it's sucrose, which breaks down your body as glucose and fructose, which is, you know, that's double pathway energy of, of, right. of what athletes are seeking in endurance sports. So it's, it's crazy all of the things that one ingredient maple syrup can do. Well, so... It's a freaking blast to be spouting off what's good about maple syrup. That's awesome. So we have two questions that we want to finish up with. Lay it on me. The first one is going to be like, so a lot of our listeners are kind of new to cycling in some respects. And so what is some advice that you would give somebody that they're just starting out in, in the sport? What would you, what advice would you give them? Oh man, it's a little bit too easy and a little bit too hackneyed, but just <laughs> go ride ignore the any stigma ignore any worry ignore the planning and just go out and start pedaling i think that often in the context of, of something as ridiculous and asinine as bike packing where there's there's huge hesitation because of the logistics that you have to jump over and it's like just go do it like figure out a single day bike packing trip and then you know that is the bigger picture of what the on a microcosm level of what a single bike ride is like just go ride you're going to get yeah. better. You're going to find what works, what doesn't work. And well, I think part of part of being a cyclist at any level is is learning to fail and then learning how to avoid that next time. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that's the logistics of bike packing or whether it's you know going for your first fifty mile ride or hundred mile ride and realizing I didn't fuel for that. Now how do I fuel better so I don't crash with twenty miles to go or you know yeah. or just you know I I just think that learning to fail and and fix you know fixing that is part of the, the cycling process, but you can't do it unless you've, like you said, just go out and spin the pedals and mm -hmm. figure it out. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. You can't figure that out from the couch. You got to go do it to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Ted, the last thing that we end our normal episodes, our non-interview episodes with is a, is a dream bike segment. But for someone like you, we're going to change it up a little bit. And the, the question we have for you is when you were growing up, what was that one bike that you were just like Jones in the get more than anything else? The equivalent of the Lamborghini Countach poster <laughs> or Dodge Viper. Yeah. Well, growing up, I had, you know, the, the, 
not even BMX bikes. They were just the little fully rigid mountain bikes that you yeah. had bombing around. I wasn't into cycling in a big way, so I couldn't have a, a sweet answer. I think my better answer is when I got back into cycling early in college. Remember the Cannondale Raven, which looked like the Super V? It was the frame is the shape of a Y. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was all the rage to have these just like ridiculous carbon layup shaped bikes. Yep. So. Oh man, oh, I want to say that's yeah. what Canada. Yeah. Do you see it? It's like the Raven Five Thousand. Yeah. Oh or something. my god! Yeah, that's cool. Have you ever seen one of those before, Andrew? No, I haven't. I remember that bike. There's actually, I'm pretty sure there's one down at um, Bicycle yes. Heaven on the North Shore. Well, look at that nice. thing. It's ridiculous. Oh my god. <laughs> So I ended up getting the Cannondale Super, I want to say Super V, which was the aluminum counterpart to this. Whereas, okay. because this is carbon, that's why it has that extra flowy. You know how many Walmart bikes have copied that design over the years? <laughs> oh, exactly. <laughs> it's uh, is awesome. It reminds me, oh, what brand was it where they had that uh, weird top tube and it was a mountain bike? Oh, I know the Pro one Flex. you're talking about. I... No, it's no. not an M, I think. Okay. I know the one you're talking about. I can't think of it off the top of my head. It's going to drive me nuts. It almost looks like an I-beam. Yes. Yeah. I, huh. I, I can't think of what that bike's called, but I, I'll, I'll figure it out once we stop recording. If, obviously, yeah. I mean, that's how it always happens. But yeah, no, that I mean, that's a sweet bike too. Really, I, in some respects, really ahead of its time. But Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's Cannondale. That's Cannondale in a nutshell. And no lie. I mean, I'm not saying that because they're a sponsor. Like, they invented BB30, what they're doing with Lefty. They're doing with AI. And that, that's continuing to grow. Yeah. I love, yeah. I love lefties. Um, actually, so cool. at a gravel race, I met a now a decent friend, and that, that was the first thing I saw. He had a lefty, and I was like, dude, love the lefty. What? And yeah. I was like, this is just, I mean, I, I've always had like a secret love, but I've never had the proverbial stones to enter that space, I guess you could say. But, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things that's that's really cool. I know uh, you're pressed for time and, you know, we, we got to wrap things up, but I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking to us and learning about you and, and all the great things you're doing. So appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. This was excellent. I know we could go on for another couple hours, but alas, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. We appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to Ted. Uh, I honestly, I felt like we could have talked to him for a lot longer, and I and I, I'm just happy he fit us into his busy schedule. But, Absolutely. But thanks for listening, everybody. If if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you listen, and and make sure you tell your friends. It it helps us get in front of more listeners just like you. And also, be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you're enjoying the podcast and want us to continue bringing you entertaining guests like Ted, please consider contributing to our Patreon page. We do appreciate your support. We're open for suggestions on topics, advice, or interviews you'd like to, us to bring to you. If you have a topic you'd like to hear about, make sure you drop us a line at 5339cycling.com backslash topics, or you can email us at info at 5339cycling.com. Or you can email Nick at I love super bougie lubes at 5339cycling.com. <laughs> Also, don't forget, if you go to our website, click on the Ask button, tab at the top, and you can send us questions directly, and we will answer them much like we did in the intro. And if we get enough, maybe we just have a Ask Nick and Andrew episode. Hell yeah, that'd be cool. So, hammer on. Hammer on, everybody. You have an email ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. Oh, excuse me. Wow, that didn't need to make the final cut. And then more stuff that needs to go because that those two bikes would cover the sl that i'd want well if you need me to you know once once i can actually get into an arrow position without crying like a child that just lost their lollipop on the ground i'll, I'll take the tt bike yeah. i've missed yeah. my 1125 i'm not gonna lie to you it's perfect for the panhandle i know that, that bike's perfect for life no, it's not perfect for life. I would not <laughs> want to descend on that thing. That would be terrifying. That is how. That is called how you descend and shit your pants at the same time. That, that is how you get brown shorts. There you go. Wow! 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 Ooga! <laughs> As I blow up people's eardrums, mainly mine. Team Lubin Tube, how can I help you? Okay. If you're going to post something, make it f***ing shareable, people.
it's like me posting things. <laughs> it's annoying. Then I have to screenshot it and send it to Andrew instead of just send him the <laughs> link. <laughs> Sorry Fuck. about your inconvenience. <laughs> First world problems, I know, but <laughs> off, dude.